Well, welcome everyone. Uh, so glad you're able to be here today. Uh, the the um, slide you're looking at is a new design that Zahira Aragon made for us, uh, and we're just really pleased with it. We're going to be using it uh, for meeting announcements, and um, um, and then she's got other kinds of designs related to it that we'll use for other purposes. So welcome and um, to the new members. Thanks for being here. We're, we're glad you're here. Uh, and to the old timers, thank you for coming too. So here's our agenda today. And uh, we're gonna be talking first about some of the new tools for both instructors and students, along with an exercise and a workshop. Next up, we'll have um, an update on the Speakers Bureau. Third, we'll talk about the new Departmental Advisory Initiative for Anthropology Programs. Fourth, we're going to um, explore a bit about AI. And then if we have time, we're going to have a very quick discussion. So we'll start with uh, Jennifer Studebaker. Jennifer? Yep. <laughs> Thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah, for having me. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm happy to debut a few new tools um, that you uh, as instructors, as well as some of your students and uh, those of you that are practitioners or job seekers might be able to use in your work. So the first one up is um, for instructors. Um, so first, we've got kind of just a great, you know, quick tips in terms of how do you build those relationships between departments and your alumni, um, as well as an exercise that you can have students do, um, reaching out to alumni for as like either a class exercise or something that they can do extra curricularly. Um, so both of these are already up on the website. If you want to access them, if you go to the, I think it's resources and then instructors, um, you'll, you'll find them there. And next up, we have uh, three new, uh, we can call them job seekers, but I think a lot of people could really benefit from them. Um, tools, um, you know, students, job seekers, anyone. Uh, the first one is really around, you know, how do we show our impact? Um, and it features, um, you know, what, you know, employers are maybe looking for in terms of like, you know, context of, of you know, certain behaviors or activities followed by, you know, real life examples of anthropologists, you know, in action in their different workplaces, um, you know, providing that impact employers might be looking for. So this is a really great, um, I think, pairing with that star storytelling tool that we also have up there around, you know, how do you really communicate about anthropology and sort of, you know, develop the narrative of what anthropology means in the workplace. Uh, next, we've got six keys for effective advocacy. Shout out to Suanna for this one. This is an uh, adaptation of a previous blog that she'd done. Um, and we've got another one coming up from her around fundraising. I just have to do a couple little tweaks and we'll get that up on the website too. Um, and the third one that's available now is Draw It, How to Solicit Drawings in Your Work. I believe this is you, Elizabeth, right? Yes, it is. <laughs> so this is a fun one if you want to think of a new method to add to your interview technique, um, add a sort of, you know, another dimension to that, um, check it out. Um, and we've got a couple more coming, uh, one around, you know, how do you gain virtual experience? And this is really like e-learning platforms that are available um, for people to use either for a little bit of money, but also some are, are free options. And then the other one is uh, a pairing with um, a workshop that I gave this Sunday, um, again, plugging Suanna's fundraising success. I think all of us could use money too, so I want to make sure I give that proper attention. <laughs> all right, so next slide. So uh, yeah, on Sunday, I did, uh, you know, about a one-hour workshop with, I believe it was our student group for the Anthropology Career Data Network around how do you facilitate for virtual audiences. They're really interested when it comes to, um, you know, facilitating Q&A sessions or interviews with guests. Um, but this also includes sort of, I would say, like some foundational 
guidance in terms of how do you develop you know the plan for your facilitation what's the timeline you should be working with in preparation as well as you know some some key questions to be asking yourself along the journey um so that i believe we've got the slide deck on the website in the recording elizabeth and yes. i'll also have a handout that is new in a couple of weeks too that will also be available um as a tool as well so it's a two-page handout any questions before we go in If, if All right. people have a question, they can uh, raise their hand uh, virtually, may, uh, use the hand sig uh, signal. Uh, you can also put comments in the chat. Oh, I see Ryle's got his hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to say I, 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 re I reviewed this workshop stuff. I think it's terrific. And I would recommend it to all of us because we did this for a student group that was interested in having a set of discussions with itself, with its own group of, of anthropology club students. Uh, and we noticed in the first couple of encounters that Elizabeth and I had with them that they were just kind of all over the map. They didn't know, you know, they were just having a chat basically. And we said, well, actually there's a better way to do this. So Jennifer <laughs> very kindly agreed to um, put this together and, and, and give the workshop. But I would recommend this to all of us because without, uh, getting too far into it, I don't think any of us are particularly good at facilitating group meetings. Uh, you notice this at SFA meetings or AAA meetings. Some people have real skills in this area. I think a lot of us assume that you just kind of pick this stuff up and you don't. It's it's something you need to learn. So uh, take a look at it. I think you might um, you might like it. And uh, Jennifer would be happy, I'm sure, to talk with any of you about doing it for your group. So that's all I would say. It's it's really worth it's worth the, the the little bit of time that you would put into looking at this stuff. Yeah, once I sign up for the speakers bureau, I'll include it in my list of, of offerings. <laughs> um, another note, um, yeah, feel free to reach out to me if you have questions. Um, to the question in the chat, yes, it is on the website. I'll go find the link and drop it for you in a minute here. And yeah, maybe maybe I'll do this at SFAs too. You know, that could be a good one to throw into the mix, you know. <laughs> all right. All right, thanks, Jennifer. All right, Suanna, you're up. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you, Elizabeth. We continue our, our gratitude, expressions of gratitude. Thank you for having me today. <laughs> I'm not um, so sure they're really gratitude. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, no, I think this is this is a really fun one. I think this is a really great addition to um, the portfolio of, of resources that the network is building. And um, the Speakers Bureau is something I think really distinctive, um, a feature about um, the kinds of resources that are being offered through the network. Um, so the Speakers Bureau uh, was debuted uh, very recently and you can see two of our fantastic um, new graphics that Zahira has designed for us to really catch the eye and uh, move through uh, our media uh, to encourage uh, practitioners to come on board as um, guest speakers for um, academic settings. Um, let's see, maybe we'll move to the next slide. Um, and this is this is the team that's kind of been behind uh, a big bulk of the work of the Speakers Bureau, highlighting Patty and Gigi especially uh, for taking on uh, so much of the the framework building and the architecture of uh, the Speakers Bureau. Uh, Matt, of course, has been uh, really leading the charge on its debut on the website, which is now live and active. Uh, and Zahir and I have been working uh, on the other end, sort of working on media and communicating it. Uh, and being able to uh, bring this resource uh, to life and out in front of the public. Um, so next slide. Uh, and the inspiration really behind this is the sort of first debut was the Become a Speaker feature, um, which is really intended to attract practitioners, um, applied anthropologists, practicing anthropologists, folks who are not working within an academic setting uh, to build a, a speaker profile on the website, um, add a little bit of bio, add your areas of expertise, talk about your availability, whether in person or virtual, um, and to really sort of have yourself 
myself there as a resource for instructors at the college and university level to review and see your profile and think about their needs uh, for classroom settings, for events, for conferences, uh, and to really sort of pair you up as someone to bring in uh, to talk about your range of experience and how anthropology fits into many different industries and sectors. Um, so we're advertising this uh, on our social media, um, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, especially. Uh, we're still working on TikTok. Uh, Jennifer and I are still trying to figure out the best methods for our TikTok approach. Um, but indeed, what it takes to become a speaker is, you know, five or 10 minutes of your time to fill out a short web form. As I said, that bio uh, areas uh, of specialty, your social media links can be a big part of this. We'd love to be able to connect with you uh, or have you connect online uh, with uh, the events and programs that you're doing and maybe highlight the network in the process. Um, and next slide. Uh, so to date, we've got 22 names on the roster. Uh, which is a fantastic uh, sort of early stage beginning of the Speakers Bureau process. Uh, you can search this list by name if you're an instructor who wants to bring somebody in with that um, uh, experience set that might benefit uh, the students or colleagues that you're trying to reach with the message of uh, the different varieties uh, of workplaces that anthropologists can engage in outside of the academy. Um, you can click on each name for additional detail. Uh, really, the network is trying to be a, a sort of a, a matchmaker in this process uh, and be able to connect uh, those individuals. The network is not stopping to negotiate any of the fees or put any requirements on honoraria or expenses. Those are all things uh, that are determined between uh, yourself and the guest speaker. Um, but one of the things that we really kind of confronting is this messaging around uh, the process of the Speakers Bureau debuting. And we'd love to get some of your thoughts back on how we can better reach instructors who might be interested in reviewing this list, not necessarily becoming a speaker, um, but uh, to be, you know, be able to engage with uh, the resources that we're building on the website. Um, so that would be maybe something for, for a discussion or definitely put questions into the chat uh, or ideas into the chat and we'll be able to start to think about building a broader uh, bit of visibility for uh, the Speakers Bureau as we move through uh, the upcoming academic year. Um, but I have I, one um, quick ask. Mm. Well, yeah, sorry, I, uh, sorry uh, Suana, I, I think we should just go ahead and take a few minutes now and talk about uh, talk about people's ideas because this is a, a tricky thing. Uh, how do you reach um, instructors? So um, yeah. Anyway, go ahead. What you you manage the uh, the conversation? Oh <laughs> no worries. Thank you. So for folks who are uh, at the university and college setting, what are the best ways for uh, the network for us to sort of, as each of us carries this message around the Speakers Bureau individually, um, and as we do it as an organization, what do you think are the best ways to reach um, instructors uh, at this level who are might be looking for, or interested in, starting to have a conversation with a, a practitioner uh, to bring them in uh, to a classroom or event or workshop setting? Well, I think we need to do two things. Um, one is um, figure out what the best way is to communicate this to the professoriate. And, you know, there are a number of fairly obvious ways. Newsletters, um, <clears throat> you know, announcements, um, so forth. But the other thing is, I think we ought to um, maybe take 15, 20 minutes, not today, I don't mean, but sometime, and draw up a list of how instructors can use this Speakers Bureau most effectively, because I think that a lot of people are in a mindset of, oh, somebody's done some cutting edge research, he wants to report on it, let's bring him to campus and he can talk to people about it. And that's that's what they think of as an outside speaker. But, but this has so many more possibilities. So they could bring in somebody, and I'm saying bringing them in visually, obviously, but bringing in somebody who can talk about um, what a particular sector is like to work in. You could bring in somebody to talk about what are the ethical implications of the work that I do? You can bring in somebody to talk about how did I get my job? Um, you see, you see where I'm going with it. Mm -hmm. So we can, as it were, walk instructors through a, a list of of reasons why they might want to do it, and they won't be able to do all those things, but they can pick. 
and they can pick more than one individual. Um, so I think that would be helpful. When we figured out what the best way to reach them is, I think we ought to then have something online on our website, uh, which they can easily go to and say, here are some of the some of the uses you can make of that. Absolutely. I love that, Ralph. I know, um, Catherine, are you, um, you've got your hand raised and you also had a question about uh, in the chat about reviewing um, the profiles. Yeah, I, I think Elizabeth covered the the review and the profiles. I just wanted to clarify that. Um, but I, I think in terms of reaching faculty, I think part of this is going to be timing too. Uh, most of us who are practitioners, the work doesn't, it, like the work is cyclical. The work is you know, it just happens throughout the year. We don't have like a set calendar to our work. And so I think we have to remember that faculty members do, right? So getting people ahead of a ahead of a semester ahead, like right now is the time to really push. So I think, you know, reminding ourselves of the timing and, and you know, the effort, putting our effort in at a time when it makes sense for people to be planning, um, I think is gonna be really important. Um, before Ryle was talking, I had another thought about, um, you know, I've talked to people that I went to grad school with who are in the professoriate and they're like, oh my God, I would love to have you come to my class. And maybe there's other people in this group who have had the same thing happen. And maybe what we do is say, hey, go to the speakers bureau. I'm happy to talk to your class, but go look at this resource first and let's you know, let's get in a habit of booking through here. Um, whatever, again, to what Susan, Suana was talking about with, you know, honorary and whatever, that's whatever it is, but getting people who are already talking to us about other things to use the, the, um, the tool, I think would help. A, a good lift with word of mouth, absolutely. Definitely. Um, Emily, I think you were talking about uh, sort of a cross-promotional sort of a, an effect. Well, from the from a speaker perspective, the idea would be um, when you have someone that's agreed to speak and they in fact then speak, have them agree to do a post about the speak on LinkedIn or otherwise, basically to get more um, an advertisement about the program and then in fact potentially encourage other peers to sign up as speakers and then ideally uh, professors are aware of it as well. It definitely, when uh, Elizabeth posted uh, earlier this week about the Speakers Bureau, I reposted, it was one of several people who reposted and added those, I signed up, here's how, here's how easy it is. Uh, and I've had a, a little bit of reaction to that. So it's that cross promotion is another great way to, to do it. We're, as we are starting to think about our strategy, Jennifer and I in particular about media around the network, we are trying to um, sort of make those asks. Um, and it, it does um, take a, just a little bit of almost like a miniature template or, or media mm -hmm. kit um, to have ready and to say, let's not just exchange business cards, but let's exchange those uh, contact forms for social media and be able to, to cross promote um, with a little notation that says, all thanks to the, to the um, Career Readiness Network. Yeah, and feel free to ping us, and we're happy to retweet or reshare uh, whatever is going up. Um, I see Rosina and Kate, you've had your hands up for a while, so maybe Rosina first. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, good. Um, so we have a small critical mass already, 22, not bad. If we get those 22 people to um, invite each other, and then on the web page, each event that happens, we, we publicize it on our webpage as well as LinkedIn and everywhere else. Then we can show what has already been done and what is being done. And hopefully that will build the number of people that come in, but we also are, are utilizing the people that we have to start the momentum. That would be my suggestion. I like that idea of keeping like a running list. That's awesome. Yeah, so-and-so did this. And this other person did that. And so, and and we can get it started with the people we already have. And so then that should build some, I hope, momentum. Fabulous. And Kate. Cute. Um, so as someone who teaches at um a regional state system where the workload for teachers has gone up considerably in the past couple of years. 
So I've gone from like a three, three load to a four, four load with governance service and overseeing student projects and, you know, ordinary life. You actually can't count on a lot of us to keep track of what's possible out there. I'm actually kind of amazed that it took me so long to find out you were there. But quite frankly, I don't have time for any of the anthropological meetings anymore, right? I barely get time to read stuff. So I think more of a direct approach is going to be important. I think possibly get um, membership lists from the AAA or SFAA and send out individual emails to departments, giving the links to all of these things. In terms of contacts within departments, would you recommend that we reach out to like maybe the admin there? Like what, like who, which roles would be the most important to contact? To like make Yeah, sure I would say our out. admin would pretty quickly send anything that's anthro related to me or to the chair. Um, okay. So if that's gonna be a lot easier than sending out a mass email to anthropologists who may or may not be teaching, um, but especially people who maybe are uh, signed up for getting things like teaching anthropology, um, uh, that newsletter, which is for teaching at community colleges, um, the general anthropology newsletter was always really useful to me to sort of keep on top of what's new that I really need to make sure that I cover in class. Um, I can honestly say, however, that during COVID, I didn't bother to renew any of my memberships. <laughs> And I found you guys because I make my students sign into LinkedIn in their senior seminar. Uh, well, that's, oh, but sorry, an sorry. awful lot of academics are not terribly good about doing LinkedIn. I mean, for people who are working as professional anthropologists, LinkedIn probably seems very ordinary to you. Most of us, many of us only join, my colleagues join, only to find alum when we're trying to fundraise rather than as an active part of our teaching. So you have to get some of us academics who have good intentions kind of in a different direction. That's all I've got to say. I, I just wanna break in and I, I think Susan had her hand up before uh, you Ryle and I know mm -hmm. we've got Melissa and Sherry too. Susan, did you? you yeah, um, I just in terms of, so uh, I, I was a practitioner, now I'm at a university. Um, and I do get, bring speakers. What would be really nice is to have little trailers, as you know that you're talking about people, um, speaker bureaus giving a little update about what they did. It would be wonderful if we had little snippets of what they they presented or talked about, just like like a movie trailer, right? Like half a minute or something, so that you could, um, when you're looking for someone. Maybe I don't know this person, um, and I would like to see, you know, how they present or whatever. It would be wonderful if we had that on the site, so we could get a little preview of of uh, the possibilities. That's definitely how the media find you <laughs> and vet you yeah. and profile you. Um, that might be a bigger build, but I bet Jennifer and I could could think about that, or we could also encourage those who signed up to add that video content to their LinkedIn, so people can can discover it. Um, or Right, or um, when they actually are invited out, you know, or presenting, they they might be recording their own presentation, and they could just take a snippet from what they have done already, yeah. as, as opposed to try to, you know, I don't want this to be a heavy lift, but it would be nice to have a little preview, right? Let me see, how do I take my hand down? I think we're getting some bird sounds, Elizabeth, if you want to get the... Um, okay, hold on. This is probably above my pay grade. Oh, how, how do I, honey. I don't. Well, honey, it's a meeting, honey. It's a meeting. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Melissa, you're up. I think. Well, honey, Sherry. I could, um... Hey, everybody. Um, so I love the suggestions that I've heard so far. Uh, Somebody I... I taught the applied anthropology course last year. And as part of that course, I invited 10 
practitioners as guest speakers, and it was it was a difficult task. Um, and I sought out, you know, alumni, and I sought out personal connections. And I think first and foremost, just bringing awareness that this platform exists. I think as long as people know about it, it'll take off. And I love what I'm hearing because I I feel that it's gonna take this multi pronged approach where it's going to be word of mouth it's going to be social media campaigns and i think that there's also an opportunity to try and build it in structurally um so for example the american anthropological association has you know memberships for departments where they give free memberships to our undergraduate majors and they send this email to the departments and say this is the code for your undergraduate majors uh to get memberships I'm wondering if we can't also ask them to include something about this in that general template as a package. Um, also reaching out as an instructor, I teach methods as well. I, I use a lot of Sapiens articles because I find that they're very accessible to the undergrads and they also have a teaching toolkit section to their website. And if we can speak with them and say, hey, can you plug us in here? Can you put our link in here? And so use kind of these established networks that are geared specifically towards instructors um, who are looking, actively looking for these tools. Um, and then of course, I know that I've, I've spoken with Suyana and some other folks about undergrads doing internships, I can see this turning into a really nice project for an intern where they can seek out specific classes like methods classes, like classes in applied anthropology, and then do some kind of personalized emails to those instructors saying, did you know that we had this? Because in our department, and Susan, you can speak to this as well. I know that if we're the person teaching that class, we're going to be really interested in this. But if yes. we're not, we're going to forget about it. We're not going to even tell people. So I don't even know how useful it would be to email you know a department chair who has a super long list of things to do versus targeted emailing that we can have like an intern pursue and also it would help that intern make connections with professors and kind of speak you know to them so those are just my two cents thank yeah. you thank you for that yeah uh just one thing uh melissa to build on your comment what if each of us asked two instructors we know uh, to take a look at the speakers bureau as an example yeah i think that would be amazing that. It, it's yeah. not that hard you could email two people you know who teach currently yeah i yeah, and, I, and I, I and it's as easy as linkedin too you know i saw elizabeth's post on linkedin and i reposted it and then if somebody else reposts it then it's just you know it's this threaded network so yeah i love that at the last AAA, I sat next to Etra from Sapien, so they do actually have some of their stuff in their, their teaching tools, just FYI. Sorry, Savannah. No, I was going to say, I know actually from working with uh, Napa, and uh, she and I are on the um, Careers Expo um, coordination team, so we can definitely connect there. I know others have great connections to Sapiens. We've been trying to uh, plan out a series of op-eds and potential articles um, that could be featured in various um, platforms as other ways to just broadly build um, awareness around around the network too. But um, Sherry's been waiting, uh, and I know that Rao wants to come back and, and also have a comment too. Sherry. As an instructor, I think this is a really good idea and wonderful service to the field that people are doing this, and it's exciting that people are excited about it. Um, I just want to point out that, you know, a speakers bureau, like, um, there might be different ways in that people are setting things up. So um, some people are front loading their classes and they're doing certain units. So they're looking for a certain type of speaker, like I need this type of business anthropologist or someone who's in marketing or someone who's in, you know, fill in the blank. Um, so that's quite different than like some of us that are teaching capstones and maybe you're trying to um, like more like jazz meet up with who's in the room that time. And so you might be figuring out like, this is my class it's heavy on these kinds of students this year, like, or you're asking students, like, what do you really want to see? And it's maybe more of a co-created process. So I think there could be some different ways in that people are using this. Um, also, I mean, after, you know, the start of online education, having canned material is also super useful. People can fit it in in various spots. I like the idea of the trailers because, like, I think it would be important 
and I'd be willing to work on this with some folks to create some supporting materials around it. Because if someone's gonna come into my class, I want the students to be ready. I would have wanted them to have watched that trailer. We probably would have talked the week before such and such is coming. What are you gonna ask them? And kind of somebody's in charge of the question. So I think there are some supporting materials we can make like to make the visit go great. Um, we can do that as kind of just a general guide or there can be a liaison coordinator person that talks with some of these new instructors. And it's like, what are you looking for? How are you teaching and help some of the newer instructors kind of get this together? But I think to even starting out, we could make some things just to make the visits go better. And some of you who know me, like I've had a, an issue, I've had to work this through a bunch of times. Generationally, there were some shifts and how people thank people is different. And that created a whole thing. And just like, how would you even go about some of these professional parts of the planning of the visit, ensuring its success, what should happen afterwards, how there's lasting connection. Like, I think there are some good, um, like wayfinding moments here that we could really help people because they should be networking all the time. But I think like what was said at the very beginning, um, like, I don't know, I can really get confused because I'll be like, well, everybody knows how to do them. Like, okay, everybody doesn't know how to do that. Back up. <laughs> you know? So like, I think really demonstrating this, not just to the students who need to learn how to do it, but to the teachers, how to get people ready to do this, um, I think is actually really important and attached to the Speakers Bureau. It's like a modeling um, so I, I'm excited about it. I would be happy to help out with making some of those. Now you're prepping for your visit material, sort of like what we saw with Jennifer's stuff in the beginning. It's like a one pager, you know, but like it's either a little flow chart, like ask this, prompt this. And the teacher should like it because it gives them something to do the week before. And then the visit goes better. And then the practitioner's like, oh, those were kind of start smart students. And maybe I would want to keep in touch with them. And maybe I would want to hire people from here. So I think a lot of good can come out of like having it go better. So Thanks I've to those taken who have a note. I've taken a note. Oh, that I said I would help with something? Yes, Darn I it. heard it. Did it. Got it. <laughs> I was <laughs> muting myself. <laughs> no, um, I think it's that's uh, that's really clever we have a we have a media guide for uh napa and the interviews that we do for snappa shots and something that is that it's not a contract but it does help set up establish the relationship so that everybody knows how to go about um each part which is really helpful elizabeth yeah um i think we probably have time for one more comment but we we have other things we have to cover today and uh one last thought anybody Rosina yeah. or Ryle? I wanted to just point out that, that what Sherry just finished saying was kind of what I had in mind, although she articulated it much better than I did, about teaching instructors how to use this resource, right? So giving some thought to doing that. That's one thing. The second thing I would say is if we're trying to figure out how to reach instructors, one excellent way to reach instructors is through their own students. Um, you know, we can talk at instructors until the cows come home about why they should do thus and such. If a student approaches them and says, you know, uh, none of us have ever met a practitioner. We understand there's a speakers bureau. You can just bring them in virtually. Wouldn't you like to do that? They might very well respond to that. So the next time we're at SFA or AAA and we run into uh, student organization people, I think we should be able to talk to them about the speakers bureau and say advocate for this on your campuses. Third thing, real quick, Andrew Marley posted something just a few minutes ago about what goes on at San Jose State. And Elizabeth and I were talking after SFAA this last time about how we ought to get more intentional about presenting things on the program which advance the teaching of practice. So, for example, I would be very interested in talking to somebody from San Jose State and having them do a session at SFAA about here's how we use practitioners in our program, because other people would then sort of look at that and go, oh, cool, I didn't know. You know, and that would be another way to get this thing off the ground. So those are just three real quick, specific suggestions. Hey, Rosina, you want to say once something? You're on mute. Yes, I'm. I'm. I'm also trying to write this. So very briefly, yesterday I had a um, pretty eye-opening meeting with, this, with the director of our center for. Um, um, teaching and learning. And he's convinced that within the next two years, AI will revolutionize and, and, and disrupt the way in which teaching is done in all fields. And social sciences and other fields are, are slated to be disrupted radically. We're already 
ahead of the curve by thinking in this way, because we're going to have to change the way we grade, the change, everything is going to be experiential learning. Um, everything is going to be career oriented is what he says. So we're in the right position if we make this happen now. Thank you. And uh, I think you'll be interested to know that part of what we're going to talk about in a few minutes is on AI. Okay. Um, so let me go back to share my screen. Okay. So, Ryle, you're up. Yeah, so I am all that's standing between you all and the AI discussion. So I'm going to be quite brief here. Um, and I'm going to um, read off the this, this sheet because I, I cannot do this um, um, ad hoc. But Elizabeth and I and a couple of other people have put together what we call a departmental advisory um, initiative for anthropology programs. The idea is to build capacity in these departments for specific aspects of teaching practice. Um, and we're interested in doing this at the BA level, the MA level, or the PhD level. It doesn't really matter. We're just interested in figuring out uh, which departments would like to work with us on this and then getting down to work. The idea is to produce a blueprint and an action plan in negotiation with the faculty at a given department for a year's worth of activity, which we would help them with, but they would have to do themselves, which would have the effect of changing or improving, expanding, extending some aspect of their program into coursework and activity relevant to um, practice. So there's a sort of a, uh, uh, there's a, there's a stepwise um, um, plan for this. Once a department um, connects with us, once a department contacts us, and by the way, we're about, we're gonna do this in the fall with one department as a sort of a, of, of a trial run. Um, we'll, we'll talk with them a little bit about what they want to do, and then we'll give them some pre-work to do, which we will help, we will walk them through questions and sort of, you know, a few sort of uh, uh, things to, to prepare for us. Then we're going to have um, them create a working group inside their department, say, okay, here are the three or four people that are going to shepherd this initiative through for the next year. I don't think it's going to be a lot of work, but we want people who are committed and people who have the time and the energy to do this stuff. We will then conduct a site visit, a two-day site visit with them, where we have a series of meetings, we have workshops, we have presentations, we talk to people, and we help them figure out how to make an action plan, how to make a, a, a sort of a, what, what Elizabeth would call a blueprint and what I would call a sort of almost like a PERT chart or a Gantt chart for getting it done over the next year. Um, we would then uh, go away and touch base with them throughout the year. And I think that the piece of this, Elizabeth, that you and I probably haven't figured out is what happens at the end of it. The department has its, its program by that time. But I think there's another step, which is telling other people about how they did that and what they got out of it. So we will be thinking about how to do that. And obviously that involves the buy-in and the permission from the department. But that's basically what we're going to do. How much does this cost? Very little. We're talking about travel costs to and from and uh, putting us up at hotels for a couple of nights and buying us cheeseburgers. Um, that's pretty much it. <laughs> I, um, we also think that by doing this, we can offer service to the university at the time that we're there. We're, we're offering to give public lectures. The university that we're partnering with in the fall has said, yeah, that would be great. Let's do a public lecture. Um, and some universities will free up funds for that sort of thing. And so the department can get some of that paid for. Um, COPA has some money for this as well. And we're pointing people in that direction. So if you know people in departments who are thinking, huh, this might not be a bad thing to do, get in touch with us and we'll talk a little bit more about how this is going to work. Uh, it does involve something of a financial commitment and it involves a commitment to actually do some work for a year. And, you know, obviously a lot of people are going to say, oh, we're far too busy to do it. Fine, then don't do it. But if you are interested, you've got allies in this network. We will help you. We will walk you through it. We'll be with you every step of the way. And I think at the end of it all, we will learn a great deal together about how departmental change actually takes place, which I think is very, very crucial for all of us to understand. 
that's it. Well, I'll just chime in here and say uh, we have a related request uh, for all of you to um, spread the word to instructors you know who will be teaching in the fall that we are looking to work with two instructors on class projects. And it doesn't really matter what the class is. We, you know, if you're, I, I've spoken with a couple of you, there was one possibility of working with someone who, um, who is uh, in museums, uh, teaches about museum work. Uh, another possibility, um, uh, uh, a professor of practice, uh, so at any rate, we're still looking and uh, time's a wasting. So um, if you are interested yourself, please contact me right away. Otherwise, um, hopefully one of the, uh, both of the other ones will come through. And now we thought we'd just go very briefly um, into AI. Uh, before our guest speaker, we, uh, a couple of things I thought you'd be interested in. Uh, there are members of the network that are blogging and writing about AI, and, and two of them are here. Zahira wrote a blog, the World of Work blog uh, post that you can see on our network, and it's about using ChatGPT to help write your cover letters. Uh, and then Bob Morais, I just learned about this yesterday, uh, wrote a nice little article um, as part of the Public Anthropologist. And it's definitely worth reading. It's, uh, he ends with buyer beware. And then one other slide, now I, these will be posted so you can get the links uh, as soon as uh, they're posted. But Matt Arts, our webmaster, has, been, has given a phenomenal keynote at the Global Business Anthropology Summit uh, in Mexico City this past June. It's now up on YouTube. It is worth every minute of it. It's 38 minutes long. And he's also got an article related to it that just came out in the Journal of Business Anthropology that is an open access journal. So you can easily download the, um, the PDF. Uh, Phil Searles and Adam Gamwell are doing a project right now where they're conducting interviews um, related to exploring how researchers could use AI chatbots. And they're exploring that through um, uh, interview analysis as well as text analysis and with the potential to use for science communication. And then last point I wanted to make, uh, Adam Gamwell has a whole podcast series uh, devoted to AI. So you can take a look at that. And then we have Keith Kellerson and he asked G Chat GPT a question. Why don't more recruiters and hiring managers recognize the benefits that the anthropological skill set can bring to their company? Keith, what did Thank you God. learn? <laughs> Can I share my screen? Absolutely. Here, let me yeah. just stop the share. Wait a minute. Yeah, okay, I got it. Multiple. Oh, no. Hang on. Host, still, yeah. I'm still not. Yeah, you're in. You should be ha having it now. Let's see where I'm at here. What did I learn? Well, honestly, this is stuff that I had been thinking about for quite some time and had been on my mind. And I was shocked to see that. Um, ChatGPT knew all of this already. <laughs> so let me scroll up here. This is the ChatGP, um, ChatGPT screen. Mm -hmm. And what he says is, while it's true that some recruiters and hiring managers may not fully recognize the benefits of an anthropological skill set, it's important to note that the awareness and appreciation of different skill sets can vary across industries and organizations. Here are a few possible reasons why some recruiters and hiring managers may overlook the benefits of anthropological skills. Number one, lack of familiarity. Anthropology may not be well-known or widely understood field among recruiters and hiring managers, especially those who are primarily focused on more traditional business disciplines. They may not be aware of the specific skills and knowledge that anthropologists possess and how these skills can be valuable in various professional contexts. 
Limited exposure. Recruiters and hiring managers tend to gravitate toward skills and qualifications that are directly related to the job requirements or industry norms. Anthropology with its focus on understanding human behavior, culture, and social dynamics may not immediately may not be immediately associated with certain roles or industries, leading to its undervaluation. Perceived mismatch. Mm -hmm. This is one of my favorites. Some recruiters and hiring managers may believe that the skills and knowledge gained from anthropology are not directly applicable or transferable to the needs of their organization. Grr. They may prefer candidates with more specialized technical skills or industry-specific experience, assuming that those individuals would be better suited for the job. Communication and marketing challenges. Now, I think this is where all of us come in. Anthropological skills are often centered around qualitative research, ethnographic fieldwork, and understanding diverse perspectives. These skills can be highly valuable in such areas as user experience, research, consumer insights, or organizational culture analysis. However, effectively communicating the relevance and potential impact of anthropological skills in a business context can be a challenge, and it requires articulating their value in a way that resonates with recruiters and hiring managers. To bridge this gap and to help recruiters and hiring managers recognize the benefits of anthropological skills, it is crucial for anthropologists and professionals with an anthropological background to highlight the specific application of their skills in the workplace. Demonstrating success stories, providing case studies, and emphasizing the value of the anthropological perspective in such areas as consumer research, user experience design, diversity and inclusion initiatives, and organizational development can help increase awareness and appreciation of these skills among recruiters and hiring managers. I feel like it plagiarized some of our reports, just saying. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure what it does is it goes into somehow it searches the many different articles uh, that are out there about this particular subject and starts creating, you know, a, a sort of a, what do you want to call it? A conglomeration of them all, in a sense, and a summation of them all. But, you know, I think, you know, one of the things that, for example, the Career um, Readiness Network, Anthropological Career Readiness Network, while you're, while we're sort of preparing students to enter the workforce, I think there's still, like what this is telling me is that there's still a lot of work to do in getting companies to recognize it from their end as well, the value from their end as well. So that's something to really think about. I mean, I'm not too surprised that it, that it, it this is a pretty, um, pretty articulate sort of response. I've been working a little bit with it too and asking it similar sorts of questions. But I mean, the reason it's so articulate, folks, and I'm sure you all know this, is because it's using our own material. Mm -hmm. That's what it's using. We all wrote this stuff. <laughs> and that is why the Actors Guild is on strike. Mm -hmm. Because eventually somebody's going to say, well, shit, we don't need, you know, um, we don't need, uh, you know, to learn methods from what's his name or, or applied anthropology from, from Nolan. We can just go on and ask AI because they've already got the stuff. Now, that's, I mean, that's fine. But you're absolutely right, Keith. I mean, what needs to happen is this This is all sort of um, good stuff. It's well articulated. It's, it's put together nicely. But there's then the so what question and this what's next question. And that's where we need to really focus. Um, and how we do that, I mean, that's what this network is supposed to be doing. And I think it's doing a pretty good job. But boy, it's a long slog because it's just hard to work with this kind of a thing when you don't get a whole lot of help from your own discipline. Individual practitioners are out there beating the drums for this, but nobody is providing the band, the marching band in the background. So um, I don't know, you know. And, you know, and that's one reason, and I think Melissa and Elizabeth will back me up on this, why I've been such an advocate for every anthropologist to be on LinkedIn and constantly promoting the discipline, either by posting articles or talking about their work or doing something. It's not just a matter of putting your profile out there and letting it sit and you know showing who you are. It's about you have a platform where you can pretty much tell anyone, everyone about anthropology and the benefits it brings. And I think the more anthropologists that are present on that platform, the more it's people are gonna see it that are out there. Good point. Plus a while back, I tried to do a small project to try to 
recruit people who are already working in large companies as anthropologists, like the Facebooks and the Googles and that sort of thing to kind of um, help promote anthropology from within and other areas besides, for example, UX. Um, I wasn't able to um, see that to its completion, but I think that's something else that you know needs to be done at some point. I was going to say an interesting sort of like a study we could do would be to like either quarterly or annually ask the same question, see how the narrative shifts based mm -hmm. on content that we're putting out. Because <laughs> I think yeah. it's, you know, it is a bit of an echo chamber and that it's just reflecting yeah. back at us what we've been saying. But I right. think if there's other stuff that's coming in, other media that it could be picking up, it'd be interesting <laughs> to see if there is a, a, a shift there. Yeah. And I've in some of these chats, you can see over my left hand screen, I've been asking GTP all kinds of stuff. And you know, GTP is very much a big topic of conversation on LinkedIn. And I've posted some of these conversations, uh, some of these questions on LinkedIn and for people to read, and they get great response. Most of them are from other anthropologists, but still, you know, it gets it gets the consciousness out there. Well, I I'm, I'm going to jump in and say, I put something in the chat, but I think, Keith, one of the things that we also need to do in what we're messaging, what we're putting out into the world, you know, it, it, well, totally separate topic, but you're right. Chat GPT is using what's already out there in the ether. This is why we see bias. This is why we see what people are calling hallucinations. I'm like, no, we lie to each other all the time. It's not a hallucination. It's just learned how to lie without knowing that it's lying. It doesn't have consciousness. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But this is telling us, if it is an echo chamber, it's telling us that we're not engaging all the audiences we need to be. We're helping Correct. students, we're helping faculty members, but we also need to be helping those recruiters. Like there are times mm -hmm. when I'm, I'm like, wow, I need to not say yes to any more recruiters be, you know, on LinkedIn, because now that I have a job with a job title that says something that they want, now I can't make them go away, but maybe I don't need to. Maybe there, maybe that's an audience we need to be talking to. Or um, also recommend someone else that's in that field that right. you know to them, like yeah. me, for example. Keith, yeah. it would be it would be interesting to run your question um, back, but replace anthropology with a different field, just to see how much overlap there is between when you say anthropology versus biology, and see if it's just how much of that is just shared reason according to ai or sociology that one would be really <laughs> i'll do that one well i think that if you were interested in that sort of thing um I, i've been interested for years because of my work in international development with how did economics come to dominate that field and if you sit in the offices of usaid united nations or the world bank you will be in a room full of economists who are basically um, leading the conversation, framing it, deciding what's judged as valuable information and what isn't and so forth. And I always thought to myself, how in the hell did they get to do that? Given that economics is nothing but, uh, uh, and excuse me, Elizabeth, you, well, and um, they're okay. I'm, I, 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 sorry, I, I help yeah, hearing yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, there's a whole, okay. But uh, economic, economics is basically a kind of psychology. Okay, that's what it is. And I mean, there's there's numbers involved, but the numbers come from places that nobody knows where, and so forth. And, okay, all oh, I'm all I'm all I'm saying all I'm saying is that anthropology has at least as much, if not more, to contribute mm -hmm. to problems of economic development than than classical like economics does. And yet, we are not at the table, and that was not preordained. That happened, and it happened for a variety of reasons. And most anthropologists do not understand how disciplinary politics is played, but people out in the workplace do. And that is one of the reasons why Elizabeth and I are very interested in getting practitioner stories into the teaching curriculum, because we want practitioners to tell us how precisely in your business, in your, in your, your sector of work, how did you convince people that anthropology was useful and valuable? And can you teach that? technique or that set of techniques to other people, because if we can't, then this isn't going to change. Okay, uh, one one more thing we want to touch on today. 
Uh, did, did I make Mark go away? I'm sorry. Yeah, he's gone. He's gone now. You don't have to worry. No, I didn't want to insult him. That's all. Oh I no, like. of course he he gets it, Ryle. <laughs> Uh, Keith, can I just take back um, the sharing? No. <laughs> Please. Okay. 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 So we heard from him. And now we have one one discussion question. Uh, a, a thought came up from someone in the last couple of weeks about having the network try to focus more on creating a community. You know, these six Zoom meetings that we have a year and the six newsletters are in some ways a form of communication, but not necessarily the creation of relationships. I mean, yeah, we get some chance to interact with each other, but this, this is just a question from someone else. Uh, should we have a regularly scheduled community event? I don't know the answer to this. I don't know if anybody's interested in it, except for the person that posed the question. Uh, we could do it if people feel that would be helpful, useful, interesting. Uh, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, every week, every month. It could be on an occasional basis. Uh, but anyway, let's, um, let's take a minute and, uh, and talk about that. We have three minutes left of the, of the hour. So uh, Gina, go ahead. Yeah, gonna... I think we can volunteer topics. You know, this could, we can model, we can model what we propose to offer others, you know, create the community from within. So Elizabeth, you know, I, I came into our encounter much later. I don't know much about corporate anthropology. I don't know much about, you know, we don't all know each other. So if we say, I'm going to give a talk on this, this is a workshop I can offer in the future, but we're all richer together and we have a higher incentive to invite more people to enjoy what we're benefiting from each other. And I think this would be a good way to build our community, be stronger so we know who we can refer as we move forward. Yeah, I think I was the one that asked the question a little bit originally. And I was really thinking about that like ethno breakfast group that meets out in the Bay Area. And that's like created a really great community space for practitioners and those interested in that space. So I was hoping we could maybe kind of recreate that vibe. Well, I bet Andrew has something to say about that. I can never find the unmute buttons because I work on so many different chat or platforms uh yeah i was actually just write, writing something unrelated to ethno breakfast which is that my team does knowledge drops we have bi-weekly research team meetings because we actually have a centralized team and it's really nice because we have a really diverse group we have three anthropologists now we had five to layoffs but we have psychologists human computer interaction people so we, we learn to speak each other's languages a little bit which is is helpful and i mean we're bi-weekly because we all work together full-time but if this group just did that occasionally stuff that's that's kind of old hat for us would be, you know, probably really useful for other people. I think we forget how diverse this group is from an experience and network layout and, and all that. Um, but but yeah, ethno breakfast is good. Uh, it's actually running into some problems because of the pandemic. They they transitioned to online, which has been nice for me because I don't live in the Bay Area anymore. But I can attend. But what they what they've been doing is having a, a host organization. So we used to go to Oracle or Mozilla or something on a Friday morning at 8.30. And they the host would choose the topic and they'd have a topic of discussion. They might present what they're working on. They might just say, we want to talk about this. Uh, you know, it, it took a, a few different forms. Uh, Ryle, I sent you a, a private message about Jane English being my contact at San Jose State for that. So she's also the ethno breakfast pseudo leader. Um, so she might have some good good insight into what's going well and, and poorly with that when since the pandemic and they switched to to online when people weren't being able to get in, in together in person anymore. But I think between what what I've been seeing in the ethnographics model breakfast model, I think there is enough diversity in this group just from the folks that I'm, I know about on here. Um, I mean, I presented on futures thinking to my research group because nobody there had ever done any of that kind of research before, so it was new to them, even though it's stuff that I've been doing off and on for 
almost a decade now. So I, I think people just, you know, what you're doing, what's going on is there, there's a lot more fodder here than it might initially seem to give a, what we call knowledge drops where I work. Okay, we have one, one minute. Anybody else? So, Swana? Yeah, I was going to say that um, maybe in, in the context of uh, sort of a, a friendly environment like this, it wouldn't be uh, too bad an idea to also invite real outsiders, um, like a recruiter or a friendly dean who is struggling with, you know, what to do with, with the department or um, other sort of business leaders that make decisions on, on hiring or scoping um, new kinds of job processes. Uh, so, you know, a kind of a different kind of a knowledge drop, um, which I think is a great kind of a model, but to have real outsiders and try to glean some of those, we've been asking a lot of questions, you know, glean some information back on, on those points uh, and, and take those, those learnings back to how we work and how we build the network going forward. Good idea. Okay, great. Well, uh, I thank you all for coming. Uh, Ryle thanks you and, um, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, be in touch through our newsletter next month. Uh, and our next meeting is going to be uh, September 14th. So you can mark your calendars for that. Um, but otherwise, thanks for coming. Hope you enjoy the rest of the summer. Stay away from the Canadian wildfires. Uh, and um, and any thunderstorms that happen to come your way. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Yep. Thank bye. You. Thank Thanks. You. Have a good afternoon, Thanks. everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Have a good one, everybody. All right. Good. All right. Great. Yeah. So. It was an interesting, interesting meeting. It was interesting. And, um, you know, this business about asking, asking chat GPT. I mean, I thought that was fascinating. But as I said, it's, it's nothing but giving us back our own writing. That's it. Right, right, and, exactly. And so the whole idea is, you know, how did, how did, how did economists manage to get themselves into positions of actual policymaking power, not just to direct initiatives, but to actually construct the dialogue within those activities for how people do things. I you think, know. yeah, I, I mean, honestly, I think it has something to do with the fact that uh, they, they view the world as their playground. Uh, oh, absolutely. No, it's a very, that, that yeah. anthropologists do not. Anthropologists want to shy away. They're, they're not public people. No, well, I, I got a taste of that. You know, I, I, I want to talk to you sometime, not today, but I mean, yeah. I am wrestling with this whole idea of how to respond to Megan at, at Routledge about this book that she right. sort of Yeah, my, my, by the way, my brother-in-law is on it. He's trying to find- Okay, good, because book. I've also reached out to the Authors Guild. And, oh, good. Uh -huh. um, you know, they have resources and, but, uh, but I, yeah, but I would really like to know what your brother-in-law yeah. comes up with. Anyway, um, and, and, and I got a little taste of this because she was very good. She she put me, she gave me the um, only slightly redacted um, comments from three of the reviewers that she ran this book, new book idea by. Yeah. And all three were very, you know, um, very laudatory, said they loved the book. It was really good. But one of them was clearly, you know, a little different from the other two. And he said, well, you know, we need to, the, the new edition needs to take, take, take account of a lot of things that are missing. Um, and he went through a list of things like um, decolonizing. Um, oh, which I, yeah, I mean, you know, and I thought, oh, yeah, sure, critical theory. And I thought, wait, wait, don't you get what the title of this thing is? You know, but never mind that. But the, 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 the two things that he said that he thought were um, not just, um, they weren't missing, but they were, they were, they were not done in a way that he necessarily approved of was the discussion of ethics mm -hmm. and the discussion of anthropology's colonial past. Mm 